everybody. I'm delighted to be joining you in Melbourne. I'm right now joining you from the Don Valley Brickworks in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm on a very uh, exciting geological formation of Georgian Bay Shale, which is a deposit that was left here about 450 million years ago. Um, and people have been really making things out of this clay for thousands of years. It's the traditional land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And so also from the late 1800s for about 100 years, um, this land, the shale here, was dug up, ground, pressed, and fired into millions of bricks that flowed to the brick buildings that dominated um, this growing metropolis of Toronto. And these shales produced like very, very beautiful colors um, and a lot of amazing types of bricks that came out of here that ended up you know, becoming architectural masterpieces, but also standard housing and everything in between. So bricks really laid this literal foundation of settler colonialism here, covering marshes, forests and fields with roads uh, and buildings and solidified property claims. Um, it formed institutions, churches and governing bodies, um, including the residential schools that stole indigenous children from their land, language and culture. And so I guess I tell this story to, to think about the the way that this material has really structured life in this place, um, the identity of Toronto and the ambience of the city. And so on top of, you know, we have still have lots of brick neighborhoods, but we can think about all the layers that have come over top of that from um, concrete buildings um, into the, the next generation of glass and steel condos that, um, that have really changed the skyline. And so if we could fly down the river, the Don River right here, we'd, we'd end up in the Lake Ontario waterfront where we would also see all of these different eras of buildings demolished and kind of making landfill that, new, that has produced new real estate. So I, I tell you this story and I wanted you to come here because I think it's a really amazing site where we can see this larger material flow, how this, play, this land has really shaped the city of Toronto. Um, we can think about the city really moving as a flow. So this is where I am, but I wanted to touch base with where all of you are right now. And I wanted to ask you to just take a few moments to look around this amazing room that you're in and to look at all of the materials in the room, but also beyond, you know, out in the landscape, beyond the windows, and to try to think about um, where they came from. Try, try to imagine, try to, try to guess, um, try to think about the different landscapes and places that these materials have passed through. Think about the way these materials have changed form. So from bedrock to ore to alloy to product. Um, and then also think about the end of life of this building. What may happen to it? Will these materials um, be reconfigured on site? Will they be lovingly taken apart by hand? Will they be uh, demolished and dumped you know, into a landfill somewhere? And how can we start to think about, um, start to ask questions about what, that, what those flows are? Um, so I think these are difficult questions, um, hard to know. And I guess I'd also ask you to think about all of the people that were involved, all of the, all of the other species that were involved in each of those um, stages and places. And so I think that's very difficult to know, obviously. Um, but I think very quickly, if I could hear your responses, I would, we would really quickly um, hear a whole lot of stories. A lot of things would come to the table. We'd start to hear connections to faraway places, um, different kinds of environmental devastations that we would connect to the, the uh, you know, colonial legacies of land dispossession. Um, a lot of things would come up. And I guess uh, for me, that, that is a way of thinking about research, which is to look at what's immediately in front of us, the materials that we're specifying as designers, and really start to try to imagine and make connections between these faraway places. Asking these questions is what I do in my research, um, and this research really comes from my work as a landscape architect, having these curiosities, but never really having the time to, um, to 
to really get to the bottom of anything. Um, you know, where are these materials coming from? Who's making them? Um, and what does this have to do with the designs that we're making in it at all? And so really, I'm, my, my intention is to try to see materials not as commodities or products, but to see them as deeply connected to other places, other landscapes, other people, um, and other species that um, are really producing the, the material fragments that we that we design with and build with. So what is, how can we um, kind of firm up that connection? So I think, you know, this, this sense of separation is not, um, it's not a mystery. We live in a commodified world and, and really this separation between a producer and a consumer is what Karl Marx famously called the um, fetishization of the commodity where um, a, an element becomes separated from its uh, producer and and is, is, is exchangeable on the market. So any stone is, 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 can be exchanged with any, any stone regardless of you know, who made it or what the living, living and working conditions were associated with it. Um, and so I think we find ourselves in this place where specifying materials really is very disconnected from, um, from understanding or having a relationship with the places that they come from and the people that are associated with them. Um, and so I think this is an existential issue. Um, it's something that everybody in this symposium, I think, is very well versed in. Um, but trying to understand um, these relationships is, I think, deeply, deeply connected to how we're going to think about um, this climate emergency and how forms of construction really need to change. So I focus my work in this book project called Reciprocal Landscape Stories of Material Movements. In it I'm tracing five different construction materials, fertilizer, granite, steel, trees, and wood, um, which all ended up in very well-loved public landscapes in Manhattan. And I trace them back to a landscape that they came from. So a really similar book could have been written about Toronto or, or pretty much any city, um, but I chose Manhattan because uh, of certain kind of canonical landscape architecture projects that um, that are really I idealized and so I was interested in in trying to see them in a different light through the material relationships that they have. So I structured this this book to look at several different material flows that passed through the city and and I take a certain approach so I trace materials to try to see these materials not as fixed commodities but as continuous with the landscapes that they come from as the livelihoods and habitats of people and other species. Um, I compare these the the production landscape with the designed um, landscape to see how these seemingly unrelated faraway places are actually co-created and in fact have a relationship. So deeper quarries in one place means material improvements in another. And then I reflect on how this relationship relates to these design agendas of projects. So how do the ideas and concepts that designers intend map onto the real relations of material production? These stories cross about 150 years and each reflects changing economic regimes, labor practices, design agendas, and also public attitudes about resource exploitation and nature, in quotes, um, adding a different material flow layer to the environment. So I'm going to walk through these different layers briefly and share images um, of, these, of this research. So um, the first chapter really starts with the ground and starts with the soil and, and the kind of fertilizer used to amend it. And it traces a very small quantity of guano fertilizer, so desiccated bird manure, um, used in the lawns of Central Park in the 1860s to the Chincha Islands of coastal Peru. So as powerful urbanizing centers like New York City were expanding, um, agriculture was also expanding and local organic manure cycles shifted towards high potency imported fertilizers. Landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed the park, designed it as a microcosm of the agricultural experience for urban populations that were alienated from the countryside. He was an agro agronomist, so he experimented with different fertilizers, including guano, um, which he had learned about during his abolitionist research in the slave states. Their plantation owners saw guano as a saving grace for depleted fields and economies at a critical moment leading up to the Civil War. 
So the Chincha Guano Archipelago um, really is an incredibly ecstatic ecosystem where layers, you know, incredible um, quantities of seabirds are um, producing guano, slowly acc accreting over over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And this accretion um, turned basically overnight into a gold mine with the rise of industrialized agriculture. And under British watch, uh, enslaved Chinese workers harvested the guano under horrific conditions, and the stock was depleted within decades. So this story really illustrates the growing metabolic rift of the 19th century, anxieties about disconnections from local organic cycles, and the end of guano um, and other mined fertilizers led to the synthesis of fossil fuel-based fertilizers which feed uh, modern agriculture and also the American Kemlon. So jumping, thinking about this, this case in relationship of the present, um, as we are transitioning, or we're thinking about calls to transition from fossil fuels, the question of how will landscaping and horticultural industries uh, confront this paradox of green infrastructure if it's so dependent on oil. So how will we grow plants? How will we, um, how will we, you know, move away from this system of fossil fuel-based uh, chemicals related to landscaping? After soil and fertilizer, the next, the next layer would be thinking about the hardening of the city in stone. So as the city became this global financial center in the late 19th century, um, crowded streets and broken pavements interfered with the smooth flow of capital and goods. So around this time, granite was the material of choice to pave streets and construct buildings and monuments. And this chapter um, followed granite blocks from coastal Maine to pave Broadway in the 1890s. Large government contracts really were benefiting quarry owners and drew granite cutters to small towns like Vinyl Haven and the Fox Islands. And as the island's quarries deepened and New York City's streets hardened, these quarry owners profited at the expense of um, their poorly compensated workers. So in response, Maine quarry workers organized the country's first stone cutting union. And this heavy flow of granite from Maine to New York was disrupted um, as paving workers in New York went on strike in solidarity with Maine workers. Um, so I'm interested in this, in this strike because it shows how uh, material flow, while it may seem like a kind of abstract concept, is really carried by human hands and can be powerfully disrupted by them as well. Maine's granite industry ended abruptly in the early 20th century, leaving behind empty swimming holes where granite had been extracted. So today we can jump from this example to thinking about other quarrying or mining sites. Um, we can think about the challenges of extraction when this work leaves toxic legacies, disregards indigenous land claims, and doesn't address material limits. So for example, where I am, where aggregate and concrete are synonymous with growth and progress in Ontario, um, groups are lobbying for a moratorium on new aggregate licensing in the name of environmental stewardship. Um, but at the same time, these aggregates are really the very matter of these massive contested new highways and planned high-rise residential towers uh, throughout the region. So there are communities and activists mobilizing against extraction industries, calling for accountability and repairing the repair of, of, um, that's commensurable with the harm that's actually already been done. The next layer is um, thinking about granite giving way to steel and concrete reinforced with steel. So steel was spreading as towers, bridges, and rail lines um, in the early 20th century. And this story explores how structural steel from U.S. Steel's carry blast furnaces in Pittsburgh um, ended up and was reorganized in Riverside Park on the Hudson River in Manhattan. In the early 1900s, the steel industry was really exemplifying monopoly capitalism by by kind of gathering and reorganizing huge quantities of ore, um, purchasing infrastructure and 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 moving all of this material around um, the country as a in a kind of massive network of um, kind of monopolized network. So at the same time, steel is materially reorganizing the modern city. 
um, spanning infrastructure, structuring concrete and supporting towers, but also immaterially through speculative real estate development. And New Deal progressive legislation was both supporting the steel industry, but it also enabled the widespread unionization of steel workers. So many North American cities lost heavy industry overseas, and these employment, uh, these kind of ports and industrial areas became abandoned, later designed into recreational spaces. And many of the most celebrated landscape architecture projects that we see are precisely these post-industrial sites. So thinking, you know, today, we can think about this loss of this well-salaried union, union employment as we consider um, a just transition or a socially, uh, social, social justice-focused transition away from fossil fuel-based economies. And we can ask how, um, how will this shift, how, how could this transition provide meaningful, fair jobs that participate in the climate change mitigation work that is so necessary? So after the steel layer, we can think then about trees. And the next story looks at the relationship between a community-driven planting of London plane trees on 7th Avenue in Harlem and the Parks Department uh, the New York City Parks Department's uh, tree nursery on Rikers Island, a kind of well-known incarceration complex. Um, so at this, t you know, this, this story focuses on the late 1950s and, and 60s um, and the context of social programs eroding, um, the loss of stable factory work and ongoing racial segregation and how this kind of manifested in a decaying public realm and disinvestment in public space. So in Harlem, um, the story focuses on 7th Avenue in Harlem, where communities of color had long fought for decent municipal services, including, um, you know, in this case, the improvement of the streetscape with trees. And at this time, these trees were coming from a very large uh, tree nursery on Rikers Island um, that was producing thousands and thousands of street trees for for all of the boroughs of New York City. They developed um, this tree nursery that could provide a cheap and continuous supply of trees uh, for municipal projects. And really the, the calculation and kind of motivation for this nursery was also the benefit of using unpaid, the unpaid labor of, of people incarcerated at Rikers Island. So over decades, tens of thousands of trees, including many of these beautiful London plane trees, were reared, tended, and later planted, um, and kind of producing the, the really glorious canopy of Manhattan. So this story looks at the street tree as an indicator of urban health, as a marker of unequally distributed environmental amenities, and as a character of gentrification as public space was increasingly privatized in the late 20th century. So today, you know, thinking about the present, we can also think about plant production and how, you know, how it needs to change. And we can think about the ambitious green infrastructure and ecological landscaping agendas um, that climate change adaptation will require. And we can think about how the horticultural industry is going to scale up production to meet this demand, how training and the making of meaningful green jobs um, are going to come about. And so what, what do landscape architects, um, the landscaping industries, have to do to kind of support this meaningful work? And then finally, we can look at um, the material layer of wood. So this last story traces Ipe, this very beautiful, um, hard and rot resistant hardwood um, from northern Brazil to, that was used in the first phase of the High Line Elevated Rail Park. Um, so, you know, the use of durable materials is really a central tenet of sustainable building best practices. But because the harvest of Ipe targets sparsely distributed old growth trees, its, its use is really controversial. And in the States in the early 20th century, um, we can think about a time when there was so much old growth redwood that reports claimed it couldn't possibly be over harvested, but it was possible and nearly all of it was, um, its populations were decimated. Um, this was followed by the widespread use of toxic chemically treated wood and later the opening of global markets uh, for rot resistant tropical hardwoods like Ipe. Ipe's 
Really extraordinary qualities stem from its growing habits, growing sparsely and slowly, slowly building resistance to rot and insects and making it extremely valuable. So very much like mahogany um, that was popularized before Ipe, its harvest participates in um, processes which drive large-scale deforestation. So ecologists suggest that while um, the sustainable yield of Ipe isn't really possible right now, experimenting with silvicultural practices might make the harvest of species like Ipe possible in the future. So Today, I think, you know, in wood construction more generally is really surging as everybody recognizes how significant carbon sequestering and renewable materials are. But wood is not one thing, it's thousands of species growing in very different contexts, um, whether industrial plantation or with regenerative land strategies. And these differences really matter. And so today, as the momentum for wood construction grows, I think it's important that we, this happens alongside attention to how the wood is growing, where it's growing. Um, and if not, using more wood just means more of the same. So all of these material flows, um, you know, of fertilizer, stone, steel, trees, and wood, were tied to very particular cases in Manhattan in this project, but I think they connect to urgent contemporary material issues everywhere, and this is where I want to wrap up today, um, to return to some of the material relationships that you thought about when you were, you know, about there in this room, this beautiful room in Melbourne, um, and the kind of larger surrounding landscape. So I want to I end by asking you some of the questions that I ask myself. So first of all, what does it mean to design in solidarity with other people um, on the material chain or in these trajectories? What kind of complications or barriers would exist to do so? What land practices do you want to support and what material production aligns with those values? What would the cost be? How would that change current design practices and, and the, the professions in general? Um, what material use could support communities that care for land or strengthen indigenous sovereignty? For example, um, thinking about materials that are cultivated and grown, um, and I know that some people in this um, panel are really working on that issue, um, what kind of you know, biomaterials, what contexts of wood or nursery stock production can enhance biodiversity, regenerate degraded soil, and address land reparations? And then finally, can material reuse honor existing materials? Construction and material stewardship honor you know, the materials that already exist, that have already been extracted and already have this, these kinds of fraught histories. Um, so how can working with existing materials remove the pressure also on the extraction of new, of new ones? So with that, I leave you with just many, you know, many questions um, that are really about you know, how can we start to think about material production and material um, yeah, material production as part of the design project itself and to find ways to, to kind of overcome the alienation or the separation um, between these worlds and see that as, as a creative act, creative and important act. So thanks very much.